I cannot think of a better introduction to the Scripture you're about to hear than the song you just heard, the song you just sang. Please hear how Mary responded to an angel. Luke 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and wondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who is said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, pour your spirit out upon the words about to be spoken and heard into that which will be thought and felt, so that in all ways we honor the spirit of Mary, who said, let it be unto me according to your word. Amen. My Advent sermon series is Staying Christian Throughout Christmas, and I phrased it that way because we have different illusions that society gives us about things we should be thinking or feeling or doing throughout Christmas that really are just that, illusions, things that appear to be real and true but really aren't. Last week, we popped the illusion bubble of gifting and what the world says, uh, how the world says we should give as opposed to uh, the Christian perspective. And now we're going to talk about the uh, silliness of making plans. And I want to get into that by uh, sharing with you a confession. It's always good for a pastor to unload upon the, the congregation every so often. And this is my confession. I am one of the world's worst travelers. I got it from my dad. Can't help myself. My family could be going to a grandma or granddad's, you know, Barb's uh, folks, my in-laws, over to the other side of the state, Kansas City, and we could have the car all loaded up. We go two blocks, and I say to myself, did we lower the garage door before we left? Did we turn off the iron? What about turning off the water? And my family will sigh and say, okay, Dad, we'll go back. Because just for some reason, like my dad did, we start to get a little anxious about things that I did not uh, remember. So you can appreciate how my anxiety level multiplied exponentially when last July my wife and I celebrated our 25th anniversary not by going to the other side of the state but going to the other side of the Atlantic Ocean to Venice to do a, a cruise of the Mediterranean I had my travel agent on speed dial for weeks going leading up to the trip I would hit the button on the cell phone, and I'd say, well, now, how much money do you think we should take and, and what, in what denominations? Or what happens if we get sick over there? What happens if we miss a connecting flight? Is there enough time to make this connection in Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera? And finally, even though my travel agent was quite patient, she finally said at the very last conversation I had with her, Reverend Weeks, please know that you should prepare 
to expect that something will happen on your trip that will be totally outside your control. You can't do a thing about it now, so just go and have the trip of a lifetime, and if anything happens, we can all take care of it. And I found some relief with that. Yeah, okay. Hmm. I cannot check the background of the mechanic of the plane, you know. I can't check to see if he had a good day or if he'd been hitting the bottle. No, I just won't worry about it. And I will go ahead with my wife and have the trip of a lifetime. Now, that's the type of advice that the characters in the narrative of Jesus' birth could have taken. Because when you see the events that happened before, during, and after Jesus was born, nothing more than a series of interruptions of plans. As a song you heard and as a scripture that Carol just read points out, Mary was totally, totally disrupted. I mean, she wasn't thinking necessarily about giving birth to the Messiah. She was just thinking ahead, this 14, 15-year-old girl, about getting married and staying in Nazareth all of her life. But boy, you talk about being interrupted and facing the stigma of having a child out of wedlock back then, uh, facing ostracization, facing uh, uh, Joseph making a fool of her, if you will. Yes, her plans were interrupted. But jo so were Joseph's when you think about it. He had to give up the idea of a storybook wedding himself. What's more, he had to give up his livelihood because ultimately he would have to take his carpentry skills and tools and head off to Egypt where he and his family would be refugees. The shepherds had their night interrupted, right? The wise men, the magi, they had their plans interrupted because they thought they would, coronate, uh, they, they would crown a king in Jerusalem only to be told that they had to go down to Bethlehem, that backwater town for it. Everybody's plans were interrupted because Jesus was born. Maybe, just maybe, the interruption of one's plans is what Christmas really carries with it. It's a baggage, it's something that we should expect. Because right now, this is a time, Christmas and the end of the year, where we all make plans. We make plans for parties, for travel, for gifts. We make plans uh, for year-end stuff at school and at work. We make plans for health. We make plans for wealth. And blessed are you, maybe, if all of your plans come about as you plan them to be. If so, that means that you never had a bad Big Mac on Christmas afternoon going to Grandma or Granddad's house and had to spend Christmas night around the toilet. I'm just saying that. <laughs> Blessed are you if your plans aren't interrupted because that means that you got your Christmas bonus. Or it meant that your car didn't have problems on your trip, nor were your uh, flights delayed or canceled. And blessed are you if your plans aren't interrupted uh, because you, you uh, were able then to cook your meal beautifully and clean your house spotlessly and let the guests arrive punctually, right? And blessed are you if your plans were, were carried out because you didn't have a fight with your spouse or your child or your brother or sister or your classmate or your boss or your coworker because of all the stress of Christmas. You get the idea? It's almost the exception to the rule that your plans would be carried out as you wish them to be. So, the number one lesson we learn from the Christmas narrative is this. Life is to be lived during interruptions and always count on interruptions. Always know that something is going to happen. It is sheer arrogance to think that you are the captain of your ship, you are the master of your fate, because you're not. It's a pretty ignorant thing as well as an arrogant thing. And once we have the understanding 
that we are to have our interruptions as sort of a, a rule of thumb, a rule of life, then we can go on to the second lesson that Christmas teaches us, which is this. Interruptions connect us. When you are most vulnerable, that is when you can start relating to people, maybe new people, in new ways and in deeper ways. You know, if you've ever taken a cruise, you know that one of the Achilles heels of cruise is the, that supper that you have uh, in the, the big dining room where you are assigned people to eat with. We were assigned a couple of couples from jolly old England, and there they are on the screen. One was from Derbyshire, and the other was from Cambridge. And the couple to the far right, well, as we ate with them a couple of nights, they were pretty standoffish. They were sort of like, I don't know, I want to say sort of snobbish, but that's the way we felt, my wife and I. But hey, it was only for a dinner, and that was it. Well, on the third night, my wife wasn't feeling too well. She stayed in the cabin. The other couples didn't show up, except for that couple you see on the right. And I said to myself, being a Christian, I said to myself, oh, this is going to be a bowl of joy. <laughs> but I toughed it out, so I sat and had my smile. Turned out that we just started talking, and I said that, uh, and they asked what I did, I was a pastor, and that instantly started talking about religion and about faith. And for lack of a better word, I witnessed to them, and they witnessed to me. They shared their, their skepticism somewhat about faith, and we found a common ground about the intersection between religion and science and Stephen Hawking and et cetera, and we connected. I regret that we failed to get their email addresses. We did with the other couple, and we're in touch to this day. But something really neat happened, and so by the end of our trip, we took that picture that you see, and the fellow to the far right who was once stodgy, well, he's not stodgy anymore. And that was all out of our control. We didn't say who we were going to eat with. They just showed up, and we connected. When you're out of your country, when you're out of your comfort zone because something you planned is out of your control and blows up, then is when you connect. Mary, did you hear carefully that story? Mary, after the angel said, you're going to give birth to the Messiah, also said, hey, Elizabeth, your relative, also is pregnant. That was a hint. And Mary then took off and for five months stayed with Elizabeth. And they did not talk about wedding plans, I guarantee you that. They started talking on a deeper level. What is God doing? And why did God choose us? And Mary would go on to connect with other people, to her fiancé slash husband, Joseph, in a deeper way. She would connect to the strangers in Bethlehem whose hospitality enabled her to give birth in a, a covered area. She would connect with shepherds who threw a party for the child and with wise men who brought gifts for the child. All because her plans were interrupted. So I ask you, who do you think in your interruptions over Christmas time you'll connect to? Will it be someone you know and you're familiar with, maybe someone you live with, that now you will be able to relate to in a different way because things didn't work out quite the way you had planned? Would it be that coworker or that boss or that teacher, or that classmate? Or would it be maybe even a stranger that you meet when you're on one of the mission opportunities and maybe you're helping a shopper at the Kingdom House Christmas store pick out uh, gifts that had been donated, and gifts in white, and maybe you make a connection. And you can see the world differently, and you appreciate the gospel of Christ that brings us together. I don't know who it will be, but I do know this, that when things do not go your way, people will come your way. So look for them. It will be almost as if they come your way on purpose. 
which leads to the third and final lesson, I believe, that we hear from this story. We really live when we yield to God's actions. I know that God intentionally interrupted that young lady's plans. He had a higher purpose to bring about the kingdom being ushered in upon the shoulders of a little baby. But even though he intentionally disrupted Mary's plans, you do understand how caringly and carefully God related to her, making sure that things worked out with Joseph, making sure that she had a place to give birth, making sure that people understood, making sure that she was safe in the exile and the return uh, to uh, Bethlehem, to Nazareth. God always caringly and carefully took care of the interruptions that He brought upon her. Maybe the interruption that you will see this Christmas is something intentionally God will do to you. Maybe the interruption that you encounter will have nothing to do with God's will or thought for you, and it will just happen. Regardless, know this, that in the midst of your interruption, God is working. And the best thing you can ever do, it, the best thing you will do, is to yield yourself to what God is doing. To be a Christian does not mean do whatever you want and then ask Jesus for advice. Being a Christian means that you hear what Jesus meant when He said, if you're going to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Don't lead me. Follow me. There's this bumper sticker that came out a few years ago that I on the first thought, oh, that's admirable, but now I think it's just tacky. Bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot. Let me use a technical term, baloney. God is not your co-pilot. That means that you just are steering the wheel and saying, well, God, where do you think we should go? No. For the Christian, God is the pilot, and you're in the neck. You're the co-pilot, and every so often you keep asking God, well, I wonder what the coordinates are that we're flying to this time. You yield yourself to what God is doing, and you consult God in every aspect of your life, especially when your plans go kaflooey. As C.S. Lewis once said, and I love this quote, C.S. Lewis, a Christian scholar, he once said, There are two types of people in the world, two types of Christians. There's the Christian who prays, thine will be done. And then there's the Christian who prays, okay, God, have it your way. We are the ones who are to work with praying, have thine own way, Lord. Thine will be done. Or, as Mary put it, let it be unto me according to Your word. Your word. Well, I will not know if my wife and I will ever take another one of those trips of a lifetime, but I do know this, that I will take with me, I'll still have my anxiety and I'll still have my travel agent on, speed dial, but I will take with me better travel advice than my agent gave me. I will not just expect that there will be interruptions, but I will expect that God will be my travel agent, and even better, a travel agent who will be with me on the journey. And better yet, He, God, will be the one who will be piloting the plane. And when the plane starts veering off, I'm not going to worry because I know God will have an adventure lined up, and it's not on my flight plan. Praise the Lord. Amen.